Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord on this Sunday morning. It's the best place to be on a Sunday. It still is, always has been, and I'm glad you're here today. Uh, obviously, James is not here today, uh, unable to be here. And David, who usually fills in for him, is also not able to be here today. So, here I am. And that... Uh, well, you haven't heard me sing yet. <laughs> All right. I kind of feel like uh, the mule that entered the Kentucky Derby. All right. Now, you have to go back to Mr. Ed and the talking horse. All right. So, the mule is getting in his spot there, getting ready to race in the Kentucky Derby. And the other horses are looking at him and saying, well, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I know I'm not going to win the race, but I just like being in good company. And uh, so I'm in good company. I appreciate the privilege to be able to lead today. So me leading the singing is only part of it. You were the other part. All right. So uh, I plan for your help here this morning. Uh, we're going to sing a, a song getting started here. Jesus' name above all names. It's a little chorus. And uh, to most people, when they hear the name Jesus, just, just think of that. When people hear the name Jesus, it brings some sort of response within sight of them. Whether they say it or not, whether they express it or not, just the name Jesus uh, sparks some kind of a thought inside of an individual. Uh, to some, it may be a sense of unbelief of who he is. Well, I, I, I don't believe in him. I, I, I don't believe in that, that Jesus. To others, it may be a sense of uh, disdain. I don't want anything to do with that bloody religion. And uh, people turn their hearts away from who Jesus is. And others, it's just kind of a sense of the unknown. Some people really don't know who Jesus is. And how sad that is. Many people just don't know him. And to those, of us, those of us that do would say, if you just knew him, if you could just understand who this Jesus is. So once a person becomes born again, accepts Christ as their personal savior, gets saved, whatever, whatever terminology we use, and they're all synonymous. But when you really get to know him and trust him, his name is just spoken in love, in gratitude, appreciation. Because we know who he is. And so when we think about that and we sing this, this course here in just a little bit, we understand what the scripture means when it says in Acts 4.12, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's something about that name, Jesus. Romans 14.11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. One day, everyone will. All right? And so when I think about that, we sing this chorus, Jesus truly is a name above all names. So let's honor that name this morning. You stand with me as we get ready to sing. Jesus, name above all names, sing it out this morning with gratitude from your heart for who he is. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Good this morning. And if you know him, that name above all names, 
thank God, we do have a place that is near to the heart of God because you know His Son. Psalm 119 verse 114 says, Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. That's what David said. In Psalm 119 and verse 117, just a few verses past that, David said, Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe. That's what this song was talking about. There's a blessing us to be near to the heart of God. Let's sing this song together, shall we? Good morning and happy 4th of July to all of you. Independence Day, what a great time to celebrate our country. It feels like I was, I've been gone, uh, and we have, but it feels like I've been gone over a Sunday, but I haven't. Uh, we left last Tuesday and, uh, for Southern California to um, do a graveside service for a godly man. I told you he was 102, he was only 101, and I, I you know, short life. Um, but his family gr gathered at the graveside in uh, Westminster, California, and we were able to uh, just celebrate his life there. And um, a lot of times I use the poem, The Dash. Uh, many of you have heard that. Uh, you have a date that you were born and a date you die. And in between is that little dash on your tombstone. But that is the most important part of the whole thing, isn't it? And so we talked a little bit about that, but then the family members got up and talked about that dash. And it is just so good uh, to hear about a man's life and to have it lived. He accepted Christ when he was eight years old in 1929. And he lived for Christ, really. I mean, and you can't find anybody that says that he didn't uh, at any time along that uh, stretch. I lived for Christ till he was 101 and a couple of months, and the Lord took him to be with him. And um, but you know what? It always amazes me at every funeral I've ever done. Doesn't matter how old the person was; they died too soon. They died too soon. There was just one more thing I wanted to ask them. And one more time I wanted to meet with them. One more time I wanted to hold them or whatever it is. And so what that is is a reminder that life is short, isn't it? 
Life is short. Doesn't matter whether it's 50 years old or 101. Um, so take advantage of those times. Go up and hug somebody. Randomly. I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But, and, and say those things uh, and, and be a witness for uh, what life is uh, as far as uh, the future is concerned. It's good to have uh, uh, a former member, uh, Linda Lepinen, in uh, church with us this morning. She has moved to uh, the dry climate of uh, Atlanta. And um, why did they call it hot Atlanta, huh? <laughs> and our good friend Karen Stockman, uh, the, both families were a part of this church in the um, 80s and on. And... Uh, raised their families through here. Glad to have you in service this morning and hope that you enjoy it and have a, a good trip home. All right, we are in part three of chapter five of Genesis, the importance of genealogies. And if someone had asked you before I started, can he make three messages out of a genealogy? And you would say, there is no way he could do this. But it is just so amazing what's in this, in this particular one. I don't know if all of them are like this, but, but they all have a purpose because all scripture is God-breathed, is it not? He didn't make a mistake when he did a genealogy. And so in this one especially, we trace the lineage of, from Adam through Seth to Noah. And then it picks up on the other side uh, with, with uh, uh, Shem and his line and then on down to the line of Jesus Christ as we move on to other genealogies. But what, it's just amazing what is packed in here. And so we, when we looked at it to start with, we, there's five points to it. And the first one was uh, a genealogy shows us our roots, right? It says where we came from. And so the Bible is very clear that we go back to Adam. That's where we come from. And how did God make Adam? In his own image. So if he made, God, he made Adam in his own image, what about us? Are we not in God's image? Did he not also bless Adam? Well, he's blessing us as well. We have that as part of our genealogy. We should be waving it around like they do the ones, you know, you spit in a jar and send it off and they tell you that you're 1% this and 3% that and all sorts of different things. And so then number two, that we, we saw how important we are to God. We are because he lists us by name. Now, I'm not in this particular one, probably you aren't either, but we are in a list that God has, and he has named these people so we see how important they are in his whole plan of salvation and leading us to Jesus Christ. And so when we see ourselves in names in this, then we're important to God, aren't we? Do you think God knows your name? Yeah, he does. And Mark, you and me, he knows how many hairs we have on our head. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I looked the other day and I said, man, the comb over is not even working anymore. You know. <sighs> but Claudia says she still likes me. So, I mean, it, uh, you know, who am I trying to impress anyway? And number three, we saw the grace of God in the midst of all of these genealogies. Every one of them. He lived, he had other sons and daughters, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. You, you, you kind of get the idea that if you're born, you're going to die. Until we get to Enoch. And all of a sudden, God's grace just bursts open in the middle of a genealogy that shows that this life isn't all there is. And God showed that by taking Enoch to heaven alive. Enoch didn't die. 
And it reminds us too that at the rapture of the church, there's going to be some people who know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior who are not going to die physically. We're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. We will be transformed in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. And we will be with him forever. So there's a whole bunch of people that aren't going to die. And God, in his graciousness, put in the middle of a genealogy that we would say, okay, let's get on to the important stuff. He put it right there to show his grace and his mercy. And now we get to point four, okay? And that should be in your notes. To show us God's patience. To show us God's patience. In Genesis chapter 5 and verses 25 to 27, we see when Methuselah had lived 87 years, he became the father of Lamech. After he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived a total of 969 years and then he, everybody, died. 969 years. That's, that's the longest of any of uh, the men that were born from Adam to Noah. There was, um, Jared was uh, like 962, so it was pretty close, but M Methuselah is the answer to a lot of trivia questions, Bible trivia. So, you know, you're like, who's the oldest man? Methuselah. Who's the shortest man? Bill Dad, the shoe height. <laughs> is there, where's the rim shot when you need one? I mean... Come on. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you with Bible trivia quizzes. Okay. So, what I, what I want us to ask ourselves in, why do we see God's patience in the life of Methuselah? What, what, what is the issue here? And you could, I could read it over and, and many times and never got it. Go to a commentary of people that really study it, and then they give you the insight onto why uh, he lived as long as he did. So what's in a name? That's letter A on your notes. And Methuselah means when he dies, judgment. Methuselah means when he dies, judgment. Now, if you will... In your notes, you will see this really neat chart. See it online? Okay. Chris has done an outstanding job of making this uh, easy to read. A couple of things just before I get to my main point. Adam lived 930 years. So if you go straight down from the 930 all the way to the bottom, he overlapped all but Noah. Right? Yeah. He was still alive. He was still alive when all these others were born over a period of almost 1,700 years. Which, why would that be important? Who was in the garden? <laughs> Who sinned? Who saw God's grace to kill an animal and clothe him? Who? Adam. And he is around almost the whole time. And, and the word of God would go out from him. So do you think he passed it on to Seth and to Enosh and to all of these others? And that they passed it on to their other sons and daughters? Yeah, it, it almost appears if you just read through the genealogy, you would think, well, he died and the next guy came along. But generations overlap, do they not? And so 
this, this kind of helps you see these, this genealogy and all the way up to the flood, the, the tremendous overlap of God, the godly line of Seth. So the message of God is being proclaimed all during that time. Now the world, we're going to see next week, that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, it is, it is so bad that God is going to end up destroying the world through the flood. That's how bad it was. And so, but all the way through here. Now, the point is, look at Methuselah. Methuselah was um, born in 687 and he lived until 1656. If you look down below, Noah was born and the flood started in 1656, 1,656 years after Adam was born or made, created. When did Methuselah die? Do you see that up there? 1656. What is Methuselah's name? After he dies... Judgment. The same, uh, this is just absolutely amazing. Don't, don't pass it over. This is the same year that Methuselah dies, whose name means after he dies, judgment, is the, day, the same year that Noah entered the ark. I'm not sure it's the same day or anything. We don't know that. But we know it's the same year in the chronology. And that's why you can't trust the Bible. What? The Bible is inspired. It is God's Word. It tells us exactly what He wants us to know. And this chronology has no breaks in it. It is confirmed, remember, by the, the writers of Chronicles that list the same order in the, Old, in the New Testament when they're tracing the line of Jesus through Joseph. It, got, it comes back to the same line, one after the other, no, nobody in between. Keep that in there, just in case you ever doubt that God's Word is accurate down to an exact year, down to an exact moment. So we have, so why, why did he, why did God allow Methuselah li to live longer than any of the other patriarchs? It's because God was patient then and God is patient now. The judgment would not come while Methuselah was alive. I almost entitled the mess, this part of it, the message, Is there a Methuselah alive today? Maybe. Because there's maybe somebody that God says he's not going to die until the tribulation starts. I, you know, that's not in there. I just, but I'm thinking that this is so precise in this timeline. But letter B is basically answering the question, why does God delay? And that is answer to the scoffers. It's an answer to those who say, when is he coming? He said he's going to come. Where is he? Do you have an answer to that? Well, if you do, Share it with me because God has not revealed it to anyone. So why does God delay to answer the scoffers? Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Clear back in the New Testament, almost to Revelation. Get way back there. First Peter chapter 3. And verse 20. Is it 2 Peter? 
will, well, I'm going to go to Second Peter. I'll be there pretty soon. All right, let, uh, let, we need to start a little earlier there. Um, start with verse 17. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for the sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago, when God, what? waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. And this water symbolizes baptism and it goes on from there. Next week we're going to talk about Jesus visiting these uh, beings, uh, the, their demons uh, that have been set apart and he is preaching that he has overcome. But what was God in the days of Noah? He was patient. And, and what is just amazing, what we're going to see next week, is how bad the world had gotten. It, it, it is so bad during the time, before the time of Noah's flood that God grieved over having created the earth. That he had made mankind. It was that bad. And so, but he delayed because there were people being born that hadn't heard the message and he wanted them to hear it. He wanted opportunity, but apparently not many lived. Now we'll go to 2 Peter 3. And verse 3. It says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, and by the way, we are in the last days. We have been in the last days for about 2,000 years. Uh, because Jesus said he, he was going to come again, right? And people, even in Thessalonica, one of the first books written, were, were looking for his return and concerned about loved ones who had died before he got back. So the last days, we're, we're in them. They just get more intense, right? So first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing. That's what scoffers do, by the way. Okay. Yeah. That was a deep theological thought, and I need, I need some amens on that one. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, not many pastors would come up with something that deep. And they will, following their own evil desires, they will say, where is the coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the, ungod of the ungodly men. But, don't you love the butts of the Bible? Okay, here we go. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. Don't forget it. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why is he delaying? Why is God delaying his coming? He wants one more person to come to know Jesus Christ. Do you know who that is? Do you know who that person is? Because it will be somebody. There will be a last person before Jesus descends. With the shout of the archangel and call us to be with him in heaven. There is going to be that person. But none of us know who that is. We don't know what year it's going to happen in. And so what should we be doing at this time? We should be sharing about Jesus and the hope of salvation. The ungodly are saying, well, he hasn't come. It's probably not. Now follow along. Verse 10. But in the day of... 
But, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, here's the question. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And that's about all you can say to that. Amen. So when we're looking at this, we are seeing scoffers saying, where is his coming? Everything is going along. We've got plans all the way along. We've got a wedding coming up. We've got, we've got this coming on my birthday, by the way. Uh, no. Um, we, we've got all of these plans, our vacation, or, you know, whatever it is, it just keeps going along like it did last year, and it's going to be that way next year and the next year. We're already seeing that that's not true. We thought everything was going well, and then all of a sudden COVID hit. And plans that we made, things that we wanted to do, were drastically changed in just a moment. But overall, people back up and said, Jesus, he promised to come, but everything goes on the same way it always has. And that was the way it was in, before the flood hit. People were marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking, doing all the things that you normally do in life. And they were ignoring the preaching of the gospel they deliberately forget. They're willful in their ignorance because God's judgment came and there was the flood and then next judgment is going to be fire. He is going to purify that way. But verse 8, he is patient. He doesn't want anyone to die in their sins. He wants everyone to come to repentance. And that's God's timing, by the way. Have you always been satisfied with God's timing in your life? <laughs> looking back. <laughs> but many times praying and looking forward, we haven't always been on the same timetable with the Lord. We want him to hurry up. Or in some instances, slow down. So Peter asked the question, then what kind of people ought you to be? What ought you to be like? And he says, we need to live holy and godly lives. We need to be looking forward to his return. We need to be ready to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Jesus Christ. So what kind of people should we be? We should be people of the word. We should know what God wants us to do. And then once we know what God wants us to do, we need to live like that. We need to live for him in light of the fact that he could come tomorrow. He could come next week. It might be next year. Who knows? But when do you start living that way so it's a life pattern? That's why it was so special for me to do this funeral in California. Because it was a life pattern for Don all of those years to live like that. So when people said, are you a Christian? Oh no, we know you're a Christian just by the way you live. What, what confirmation that is to us. I, I have written in my Bible the, the time that I accepted Jesus Christ. I was 10 years old. It was in a tent meeting, and the evangelist preached a gospel message, and I walked down to the front and sat there with a counselor and prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know that he came into my life at that time. But you know, that wouldn't make any difference at all if my life hadn't changed. Now, I was 10. I was, you know, talked to my mom. There might have been some problems, but... But as, I, as you begin to grow, how do you live your life? What could they say about you and how you spent your life? 
I have a daughter that is kind of arm's length from us. But one thing she can't accuse me of is not living for Christ. Not making my priority the church. And even before I was a pastor, when Sunday came, I got up and the family got up and we went to church. Didn't have to. Didn't get paid for it. We went. We lived our lives according to what God says would please him. And, and I don't do it by the law or anything like that. I just look at it and says God would be pleased if you did this. And I was doing it. And so when I go to sleep at night and there's maybe a doubt or two creeps in whether my salvation is real or not, I look back at the life. And if it wasn't real, why am I doing it? And so we need to be... We need to be people who are leading godly lives on a regular basis and not on the last minute trying to get it all together. It needs to be a lifestyle and be ready for his coming. So God is patient and we have a responsibility to live for him and also to proclaim him. Number five is to show us our hope. Verses 28 to 32 It says, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived a total of 777 years, and then he, what did he have? He died. He died. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If you notice on your chart, only two sons outlived their fathers, Enoch and Lamech. Just a side note, really, on that. But, um, and Noah, it says, will comfort, but his name means rest. He will give us rest. Well, I think maybe those who were around thought rest would come some other way than the, the world being deluged and flooded. But uh, God had his own way of making that rest. And the other thing that I saw in there is that he was named Noah because it said he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground that the Lord has cursed. This is almost to Noah. This is almost to the flood. And what do they remember? They remember God's curse on the ground. Adam himself was not cursed. We are not cursed as, as people, but the ground was cursed. And 1,500 years later, 1,600 years later, they still remember why they have to work so hard. It was, how did they know that? It had to be passed down. It had to be passed down that God had cursed the ground. And, and Lamech was trying to look at this son, this Noah, who would give him comfort from the toil that all uh, the, the earth was giving them at the time. The curse is still fresh in their mind. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, Heaven must receive him, that's Jesus, until the time for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. God, God's going to restore it. I think Noah was a type. And when he started off, you know, once the ark settled and everything, they, they started to farm and do all the things that they uh, needed to do at the time. And things were going along, and we'll see that that doesn't turn out very well. Uh, because evil even made it through the ark. Because there were people with sin natures. I believe all of them were saved, but they still had a sin nature. Have you noticed your offspring? Even if you're saved, they have a sin nature. 
We have to deal with it individually at each time. But it says that Jesus is going to come again and he is going to restore all things. I believe that, first of all, is going to be in the millennial period on the earth. Um, and then after uh, the, the judgments and the purging of the earth by fire, I think he is going to restore this world, not remake it, this world. And this is where we're going to spend eternity, in a Garden of Eden-like place. Letter A in your notes, there are th three things that we want to take a look at on how God is showing us hope through this genealogy. First of all, all must die. We, we should not be surprised when people die. I mean, we can mourn, we can be comforted, we can encourage one another doing it, but we should not be surprised when somebody dies because that is the curse on man in the sense that when man sinned, sin brought in death. And it's been one for one ever since. So, was death natural when Adam and Eve were created? No. So many people talk about death is so natural, we ought to just kind of accept it in the flow of things. Death is not natural. And I think many people who, who reject Jesus Christ, reject God, atheists, I think they're afraid to die. Because the, death is not natural. And sin brought it about. And today's teaching is that it should be quite natural, but, but there's no moral meaning then to your life if it's natural. What brought it in? So why do people fear death so much? Well, I think all of us have a little bit of fear of, and trepidation of going through the veil, right? How many of you are looking forward to dying? Well, not, most of us aren't because we've never been through it before, right? Yeah. But the fear of death is not the dying. The fear of death is the judgment. There, there's, whether you want to be, believe in God or not, there is within us built into us the sense of eternity and that we are responsible to someone outside of us. And that, the Bible tells us, is God. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, nothingness. No. After this, judgment. Methuselah, when he dies... Judgment. Same pattern. When we die, judgment. And the glorious thing about being a believer is our judgment isn't whether heaven or hell is at stake because heaven is sealed. It's rewards. But for those who have never accepted Jesus Christ, the only judgment, that great white throne judgment, is to identify, they will be identified with Satan and his and evil, and they will see themselves as sinners who have rejected the gospel message, and they will be cast into hell for eternity. The reason that people fear death is because of judgment, that they finally are going to have to face the judge. And he will be fair. He will be just. But when the books are open, everything will fall short of pleasing God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've, I've told people before, all you need to do to get into heaven is to be perfect starting at conception, never having sinned once. And nobody passes that. Nobody passes muster. We have all sinned. We have all rejected God. And it is only by God's grace 
that we sit here today, most of us are, hopefully all of us, as we sit here today or online, that we have accepted the payment for our sins through Jesus Christ. He is the only one ever to have lived a perfect life. He did not die for his sins. He died for our sins because he was perfect. So we see that all must die. Sin is the cause of death. And let her see, there is an escape plan. Because you look at our genealogy and you will see that only eight people survived the flood. Only eight people got on the ark. So that means certainly that the Canaanites uh, were living away from God. But it also meant the line of Seth, most of those also followed in an ungodly line. And for some reason, and I don't see it here, but that all of those who believed, I think Methuselah was a believer, um, Enoch for sure, and you know, each one of those that are listed there, I believe that they believed and they also had their families, but they must have all died before the ark was opened and allowed the animals on and the people on because it got down to eight people. There is an escape plan. And both lines, whether Cain or through Seth, they were affected by evil and only that small remnant escaped. But you think about the judgment of God and even in Adam's day or in Noah's day, there was no escape outside of God. You, you, can't, you couldn't escape that on your own. Evolution has made a big deal about um, the evolutionary uh, scale in, in rocks. You know the fossil record? And it's the fish down here and then a little more complex and more complex. You know what it was. The smarter you were, the higher you got. And so what do we normally find at the, the, at the top of the scale of the fossil record? It would be man. Because he would try to get to the highest point. He would keep working at it until he got there. And then he, too, was inundated. So we can't escape on our own. The only way that we can escape is through Jesus Christ, who conquered death. He brought about the transformation by bearing our punishment. And he said, I'm putting to rest the fear of death because I have taken that punishment for you. I love that hymn that we sing, and we're going to sing it this morning. Jesus paid most of it. That was a first draft. Jesus paid it all. All? What does all mean? It's all. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we can sing that song from the depths of our heart that Jesus, Jesus paid it all. He paid and covered the sin and the guilt and the judgment and he has set us free. Jesus paid it all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, Our goal in this life is to please Him and appear before the judgment seat of Christ and receive what is due us. We are, as believers, we're not going to be judged to go to heaven or to hell. We are going to be judged for what we did while we knew Jesus Christ. And the wonderful thing about that is when we do something good for Jesus, we teach a class, we sing a song, we play the piano, we, we usher, we do the sound. Whatever it is that we do, we offer that to God with a heart that is full of honor and praise to him. And he accepts it from us, even though it's flawed. I don't think there's a thing that we've ever done that is not at least a little bit flawed 
with, with sin, selfishness, whatever it is. But do you remember your kids bringing you in the dandelions? Oh, here, Mama, I have a bouquet for you. And you said, those are weeds. Take them back outside. No? What'd you say? Oh, thank you. These are the prettiest things I've ever seen. Why? Because you love that child. You love that grandchild. You, you, you want to make them feel like they have done a, a great thing for you. And that's what Jesus does with our works. We think they're pretty flowers. And they might be. But most of the time, there's a weed or two in them. And Jesus accepts it. And what he does then, and this is the beauty of this, he purifies it and makes it what was intended in our heart and gives it back to us and says, wait till the judgment of believers and I'll count it for your good. Isn't that wonderful? So when, when you start to think, well, I just didn't do, do that very well. I don't know if God's going to be pleased with it. Where was your heart? What were you trying to do? And I think you offer that to God. And he says, oh, my son, my daughter, I love you so much. I take it, I'm, I bless it, I purify it, and I hand it back to you as a reward. Oh, what a God that we serve. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He knew. And so as we bring this to a close finally, 1 Corinthians 15 says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He just can't stand himself, can he? Paul just... Let's it out with praise. He gives us the, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not useless. Whatever you do, he takes his children and he purifies it and says, well done good and faithful servant. So are genealogies valuable? Oh, amen. It's been such a blessing to go through it. And I hope your hearts are encouraged too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you, you don't leave anything out that's important in your word. All scripture is God-breathed. And it is profitable for all things in our life. Help us to be students of the word, even when sometimes it, it doesn't make all that much sense. Help us uh, to ask you for your spirit to guide us and to uh, show us even deeper things so that we might be even more pleasing to you. But help us to live holy and godly lives in light of coming judgment. And Father, I know that uh, we as believers will be caught up in that rapture, but we want as many to go with us as possible. May we share our faith in every card that we write, every birthday uh, greeting, whatever it happens to be, Father, may we let people know that Jesus loves them and wants them to spend eternity with him. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. For the reminder, of God's word is always accurate. God's word is always true and always can be trusted. When he's talking about Jesus paid it all, just, well, I'll say every, every, every kind of insurance policy you have. I don't care if it's health insurance or insurance on your home or your vehicle. They all have what is called an exception clause. Warranties have exception clauses. I'm so thankful when it comes to salvation, as Pastor so clearly pointed out, Jesus paid it all. Or we'd all be excluded. 
Let's stand together and sing this song together. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Praise God. We can sing this next song. Now, I belong to Jesus. And not just that, he belongs to me. What a beautiful relationship God has provided for us. It's just awesome. Let's sing this song together. Now, I belong to Jesus.
Lord, this next song kind of reminds us uh, we all want to get to heaven. Jesus paid it all, but we're not there yet. All right, we're all still here. However, life can be pretty good knowing the Lord down here, can it? And so, uh, but until that time, until then, I'm just going to keep going. All right, let's sing this song together. Until then. great things to look forward to. Let's sing that last verse together. Please join me in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It is my earnest prayer that you would have the 50 states of this nation in your holy protection, that you would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of deference and obedience to government that operates in accordance with your holy plan, to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another for their fellow citizens of the United States, and that you would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and peaceful temper of mind, which are the, divine, which are the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed faith. And without 
a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. And dear Lord, we lift up today our missions and our CareNet ministry. We ask that you would bless them, protect them, and prosper them. We ask for your hand of protection and for joy of uh, family gatherings for those who are traveling uh, back uh, this uh, weekend from being somewhere. Pray for those who are home uh, ill. Uh, thank you for those who are recovering from surgeries and uh, treatments. And we pray especially for those who uh, are uh, struggling in care and knowing uh, uh, quite well that we are all mortal and they, they see their uh, last day on this earth and their first day in your personage uh, coming soon. We just ask your hand of uh, kindness and mercy on them in those last days. And uh, we uh, lift these prayers up in the name of your blessed Son, our Savior, and our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. The uh, first part of that uh, prayer actually is from a letter that George Washington, General George Washington, wrote to uh, the 13 states after the first peace treaty had been signed with England, the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, stealing this much of Mark's thunder, but if you read the uh, Pray for America edition of the One Year Bible, you'll find it in there. I had to update it because there weren't 50 states back then, but uh, a, f a few things like that. But uh, you can see where his heart was and uh, how it's still true today. So if we can't imitate Jesus, uh, our nation will not continue. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. Where am I on my slides? Okay, well, welcome and uh, happy 4th of July weekend. Okay, good. All righty. Well, in, in the remaining many days of this month, uh, next Sunday we have communion. That's bread and cup here in the sanctuary, so just uh, plan for that. And then in two weeks, uh, we'll have Sandwich Sunday, uh, where we uh, all bring a little bit of something, and then we uh, put it together, and it's a lot more than we started with, and uh, we all have a nice gathering together and uh, uh, food and uh, fellowship. So plan on that. We'll be giving some more information on that uh, sometime soon, so you know what to do. Okay, some of you weren't here last week, but just to remind you, that we do have the new alarm system covering our auxiliary buildings. So if you have any reason to be getting into one of those or into the mower shed or something like that, uh, uh, make sure you know how to do it. Otherwise, you'll be greeted by a very loud sound and maybe some people wearing blue. Okay. And I, I can give you that, inf that information. It's, it's simple, but, you know, one little step can be kind of exciting. All righty. And uh, uh, we, are, we see our little feller or lady up there. Uh, remember Karenet? Just today somebody gave me one of those heavy baby bottles, and you can keep filling them up and keep giving them to me, and I don't mind having, a, having two truckloads to take to them next time. If you're at home and you need to send us something, or if you want to send us an email, or if you want to send an email that goes to all the elders, all that information is on your screen. And uh, there's uh, going to also be on your screen the minutes, minutes, well, the answers. How about that? The answers to today's sermon notes, which will uh, be uh, available here in the sanctuary if you want to stick around and watch it on this screen, or in your living room if you're watching it on your screen there. Okay, well, that's what you see, a big thanks. That's what we want to give to our uh, music team today because uh, uh, we had beautiful music coming, but we were minus a violin, and uh, Dave is home uh, recovering well from COVID, so uh, he wasn't there to help us, but Mary and uh, Jim did a wonderful job, and uh, just uh, Pastor John uh, filling in admirably in uh, music and with the help of Marshall. So I think let's give them all a hand. Okay, let's see. If I push the right button at the right time, we're going to have a mini movie coming up uh, in recognition of the uh, uh, 200 and what is it? 250 or 46th anniversary of uh, July 4th, and uh, remember some of the reasons why uh, this nation has been here that many years. And then after that, uh, Mark will come up for the one year Bible, and uh, we'll have the offering too.
Uh, good morning, church family. It's so good to see you all here. It's so great to be here. I'm so grateful, so grateful. I don't know about you, but I am grateful for the rain. I had all kinds of pollen on my car. <laughs> it's gone now. It's a beautiful thing, so I'm grateful for that. But uh, I'm so grateful God, for God's word. And, uh, you know, one year, one year Bible is what I'm here to talk about and encourage you to be in it. And uh, the, the question I've asked many times, I'm going to ask again. What's the best day to jump into the one-year Bible reading program? Today. today, today, and oh my goodness, if you've read it today, I, I'm so excited, I just can hardly contain myself. In fact, just listening to Pastor Dave talk about how it all relates, it all ties in together, and uh, today especially in the Old Testament, uh, Josiah, this king, comes along, the nation of, uh, well, the, the, of Judah, the tribe of Judah in Jerusalem is in complete shambles. Things are going horribly. And this king comes along and he says, hey, let's go ahead and, and do some work on the temple. Let's, uh, let's uh, fix the shutters. Let's spruce it all up, the, 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 the temple. And they find this thing. They find the word of God. It had been lost in plain sight. And they find it. And what does he do? He tears his clothes. He weeps. He mourns. He says, this is why things are so bad. This is why we have not been following the God, the God of creation who loves us so much. And it's all right here in this book. And they, he took it and he read it and he wept. And he took it to, before the people. And they wept and they committed themselves to God. And he went before in the temple. He prostrated himself before God in worship. And God came and said, you, have, you all have messed up. And destruction is going to come. There are consequences to sin. But bless you for your response. Reading the word of God. Knowing who God is. So today's a day of, in a reading, a day of great stories of repentance. He repented from where he was. The people repented and prosperity and goodness came back. And then in the New Testament, Paul has just been arrested or taken hostage basically. And he goes and tells these people who were trying to do away with him. There's all kinds of speculation about who he was and the trouble he was causing. The, uh, the authorities come and grab him and they're going to throw him in prison. They didn't know who he was. It just a, caused a huge, a huge upheaval. And he gets to tell them, this is who I was. I was like you. I was putting people to death and sponsoring it. I was traveling around trying to stop the gospel. And then I met Jesus on the way to Damascus. And he did a 180 in his turn and his thinking, and he repented, just like the people in Jerusalem did. They repented. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing to understand who God is, who we are. And let's just say there's a huge chasm there. Who God is and his holiness and who we are. And through Jesus Christ, we have the right to become the children of God through Jesus Christ. What an amazing love story that is. And the more we understand that, I had a, I had a, a couple uh, at work this week, a young couple, I was dispensing some of, my <laughs> some of my marital wisdom to them, you know, said 35 years of marriage has taught me a few things, and so I was trying to help this young man understand how to honor his wife and uh, giving her preference on seat assignments on an airplane. And anyway, but they asked me, 35 years of marriage, what do, to what do you attribute that? And, and I gave him an answer. And the more I thought about that answer, the more we understand what it is to be loved by a holy God and to be reconciled to him through his son, Jesus Christ. The, the, the awe that we have for God, the humility we have of where we are and how Jesus brings us together. The greatest love story in the history of the world. It is the history of the world right here between these pages. So I want to encourage you to be in God's word every single day. Every single day, be in God's word to understand that better. It'll help us in our relationships. It'll help us in every aspect of our life. Until then, what a great song that is. I can hear my dad singing that. And you know, we face some trials. We face some difficult things in this life. But until then, we will carry on. And today we start in the Psalms. We start over, Psalm chapter 1. And it's a great one. I just want to read a few verses here for, to begin with. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight 
is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. What a beautiful passage of scripture. And I just love how, again, once again, this, this reading program ties together in such a beautiful way. As I've said so many times, if you want your pastor to be brilliant, spend more time in, your, in the word of God, and it'll come alive each and every time we read it. I heard somebody in the news say this week, keep your mystical book. I don't believe in it. Oh, my goodness. What a misunderstanding of what this book really is. What a misunderstanding. Be in it, share it, meditate on it, and uh, seek God and love God with all your heart. Let's go to him now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the rain. We're so grateful for your servants here that are leading us. We're so grateful for your word that enlightens us and shows us who you are in your magnificent love for us. Father, we just pray that we'd understand that in a greater, deeper, and more comprehensive way each and every day. Father, that we may be able to rejoice with you each day, but and look forward to the day of your coming. What a beautiful thing that will be. Father, we ask now that you just bless these tithes and offerings, these gifts. Father, to the gospel, that that last person will be reached. Father, we look forward to that. Help us to be good stewards of our time, our resources, our assets, and that you would be honored in all that we say and do here. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. say they're ashamed of our country. We all admit we do not have a perfect country, but God has blessed us so very, very much. I remember when I was growing up in an elementary school, every day that school would start, we would stand and sing this song and say the Pledge of Allegiance to America. That was the norm. We can't give account for what everyone else does in America, but today we can stand together. Stand with me. Let's sing with a heart of thanks on this Independence uh, Weekend. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom. Another song with patriotic flavor to it. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Let's sing this last song together this morning before we dismiss.
so much, everyone, for coming out today. It's been a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, enjoy your weekend as we remember the force tomorrow, uh, the joy of it, the privilege of being able to be a part of such a nation. We have been so blessed. God bless you. You're dismissed.